You're listening to the Inspire Excellence Podcast, recorded at the BVA headquarters with your hosts, Kevin Miller and Tommy Alquist. Each episode is focused on shedding new light on different perspectives to create dialogue that inspires excellence. And welcome to the Inspire Excellence Podcast. Tommy Alquist, Kevin Miller, and a very, a very special one today. Of course, they're all special, but when we're talking about what makes all of us tick from young boys and young girls to the who we are today, Tommy. Yeah, Kevin, it's nice to see you again, and we're back. Uh, you know, one, one of the things that happens with these podcasts is we, we get a lot of requests. Most of them are business-related. I'd say that 80% of the people that call in and say, hey, have you thought of getting so-and-so on? Who's a great business leader, and they'd have a great story to tell. We'll get some other topics. We've done some other good topics, but got an interesting request. Uh, I had a, a young father send me a long email, and he just said, hey, you have a lot of people on there that, that talk about success in life. But could you have someone come on and talk about how to be a successful father? I think that would be a phenomenal episode. And literally, I, I think I, I got the email and I immediately thought, one, that's a great idea. And then these two guys came to my mind right away. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but I'm going to do maybe a little bit of an intro of why I thought of you. Is that all right? Absolutely. So first of all, uh, Peter Oliver, uh, you know, very, very well known all across the state. I've been in real estate for a long time, but really a community leader, pillar of our community, Peter. And I, I, I've known you for a long time, and I know you as a great business guy. But every time I'm with you, you say something about your kids and your family. But in my mind, you're first one of the best fathers I know, and then you're everything else. So I thought it would be great to hear your perspective because your kids are now uh, successfully moving on and kind of out of the house and great stories to tell. And then I thought, well, we got to have a little contrast to that. And I thought of Brady. So Brady's kind of at the other end of the spectrum. But, but when I think of Brady, I literally think it. So Brady's um, one of the owners of Peter Sonato with his father and a great business guy too. But when I think of Brady, the first thing that comes to mind is that guy is a great dad. And I happen to know his dad a little bit too. And I know he was a great dad. So and his grandpa, who was a great dad. So uh, I thought, let's get let's get kind of two perspectives, kind of the young dad and the, the guy that's uh, that maybe been through a little bit more, and we can talk about fatherhood today. So with that intro, can you guys first tell us just a little bit more about you so the audience can know a little bit about you, your family, your business, just go into pretty good detail about what you do, and then we'll get into the fatherhood thing in a minute. All right, great. I guess <laughs> I'll go first. So I'm Brady Peterson, and and uh, born and raised here in, in Boise area. I guess I grew up over behind Capitol High School, but um, my family does cars and have been doing it since 1923 over in eastern Idaho. Then we moved over here in 28. So um, love love this place, and I'm, I'm thankful to have gone other places to be able to realize how awesome Boise is, but love Boise. My, my wife's from Las Vegas. She loved Boise. We pitch it to her family every trip, and they're on, they're on the cusp of coming up, but um. Three kids, ages two, or no, we just had, I had a birthday a couple weeks ago, three, five, and seven. And, uh, God, was that, did I cover it? Car guy. I think I mentioned that. Yeah, that's good. Makes awesome commercials, I might add. I love, <laughs> I love the commercials. And so we've been in Boise now for 27 years this year. Uh, moved up here from San Diego. I'm not a transplant, I actually grew up in Taos, New Mexico, of all places. But I uh, lived a very colorful, diverse uh, life, which I'll share later, which ties directly into our topic today. And we've been here. It's been a, a great place. We have four boys that are uh, just turned 17, 18, soon to be 19, 23, and or almost 23, almost 25. So just a great spectrum there. The first two are 21 months apart, and we have a little gap, and then 21 months apart. So very close uh pairs, I guess, but all four of them just love each other and great family. Boise's been phenomenal as a place to raise a family. Been in the business for commercial real estate business for 30 years this past August. It's all I've ever done. Love it. Mainly because of all the people you meet. Real estate is kind of a platform. That's what I call it. It's my platform for doing community work, uh, working with different developers, brokers, just everybody involved. And that's, that's what I love. It's my opportunity to give back. It's great. Well, I'll I'll start with uh, with uh, with uh, the big question. What is who are your role models? Who's been your role model in your past, and has helped you uh, shape of who you are and and how you become a great dad? Oh, I guess I had a few 
growing up, but it's hard to look past my dad was everything to me. Ab- absolutely my hero. Uh, growing up and he'd take me downtown um, to the dealership and I just thought he was in charge of the whole world and mm. and he, he loved me and I loved getting attention from him and because of that he got me into golf. Probably something I ne- wouldn't have tried without him but I, I just love to be with him so we golf and, and he lives in the Philippines now so I, I miss him but my dad's m- was a big role model for me and then I love sports growing up so I was all you know trying to find role models role models there some of them worked out some of them not so much but uh <laughs> yeah and then and then just met in my community and and this guy uh, across from me here Tommy and um I you know I think the first time I, I met you or one of the first times when I really remember being with you was on a a, a wilderness trek thing out in Wyoming and uh well, I don't know if you remember that like I do but uh but Tommy was a role model as well, and I was lucky to have great men in my lives that in my life that weren't my father. Because at some point, you kind of question that, you know, my dad. You, you kind of you have to find some outside, you know, guys to look look up to. And luckily, I had some great ones right in my own neighborhood. Tommy being one of them. Sure. So I, I touched on this a little bit earlier. My my uh, upbringing or my family time up until. You know, now has been very different than most, definitely different than Brady. So I, I was adopted to start with, and you have to know I'm very transparent with my with my life and my history because that's part of how I connect with people and am able to help them. So I was adopted to start with right out of the oven, and when I was about four, we were living in Florida. My my father coincidentally was an architect slash developer, and we were the classic middle class family, and and. Uh, Late sixties, my parents decided to uproot and try and find the meaning of life. So we left Florida, left our house, everything, piled into a van, not a Volkswagen van, but a but a white van and left and drove all around the country and ended up in Taos, New Mexico, which at the time was a big uh, hippie mecca. And uh parents split up and I was basically raised a hippie kid in the comedy. And I had crazy boyfriends from of my mom's stepdad, so I had what I call negative role models. And for, for whatever reason, even when I was little, I was able to look at these guys and say, I'm not going to be like that. And I'm not going to do that. It was very odd. And I can give you very specific examples of, of different times when that was very, very strong. So that was a, <clears throat> that was a lot of how I started to, to figure things out. And then interestingly enough, kind of on the contrary, I had very strong women in my life. My grandmother was my rock until she passed away. My last name is Oliver. That was her maiden name. And I actually changed my name in her honor when I graduated from college before I started working because she was, she had such an impact on me. And she really talked to me and taught me about being a, a future husband, future dad, and a man. So I had these female influences that helped make me who I am. And then beyond that, to Brady's point, I've always had eight to 10 mentors around me. Half of them know it. Some of them don't, younger, older than me. And I basically spot people and say, they do this really well. And I want to be like them. And I'm going to take that piece. And I call my life, you know, building the airplane as I fly it. And that's really what my life has been about. So that's how I've kind of uh, shaped myself as a dad. And plus, I've read just about every book under the sun about being a dad and then transition as we were having boys, bringing up boys, raising boys, you name it. And, uh, and of course, my wife is incredible and we make a great team. But that's how I've built who I am as a dad and a husband. So I love where we're starting here. And I think for anyone listening out there, what I heard, and I want to ask you a couple more follow-ups, is, is it takes work. It's intentional. I think there's a lot of people... Uh, and I, I would say, Peter, being around you, just because you're on the back end of watching you raise these kids through those teenage years, um, it's very intentional. Uh, you read books. You looked for mentors. You thought, how, how am I going to do this? You talked about partnerships with your spouses. Tell, give us a little advice for those listening about how important it is to put the work in and not just assume this thing's going to happen with your marriage, with your kids, with the process. I think that's so critical because 
Um, I think one of the big mistakes is people think they can not put the work in. Absolutely. I mean, that is, that's really the key, Tommy. And, and you can read all the books you want and you can go to conferences and seminars, which I've also done on being a dad and a husband and everything. But to your point exactly, if you're not willing to commit and have the discipline and implement it and really focus on it, it, it really doesn't matter and you won't see any results, right? You just become an intellectual. So that's, that's definitely been, uh, the backbone of who I am. We're very committed. Uh, my wife, we've been married uh, 29 years and every year gets better. And I'm not kidding. It's, it's amazing, but it's because we both work at it and we both listen and we're both flexible and we get help where we need it. I had to, I had to get a lot of help to come out of that pond that I was raised in. I mean, I could tell you a lot of crazy stories, but I was willing to do it. It took a lot of work and it was very painful at times. And you, you never stop learning, right? As your kids grow, they go into different phases. I'm in a much different phase than Brady, but you just always have to be open and you always have to be exploring and looking for that next lesson that's going to come to you. Well, Brady, do you feel sad? Wow. Well, yeah. Um, I appreciate your thoughts. It's really fun to listen to Peter. Um, <laughs> You know, I guess my perspective with that is is absolutely takes takes work, and and I think people my age and and younger, you're kind of looking for some you know magical scenario. How how does it work? You see people in beautiful families, and you wonder, you're like, you know, what is this like? And I've been married just coming up on ten years, and as much as I tried to mess up who I married, I think my folks were praying for me or something. You know, prayers were coming. You know, I found the right gal, <laughs> and. uh and it is, it does, it takes work after you get married. I did, I feel like I married someone that was super compatible with me and, and love her to death. But you, you know, no matter where you are, when you get married or whatever, you got to have a common goal and be working towards that. And, and a huge part of that is, was kids for both of us and raising them in the same way. So yeah, it's a constant, I'm always trying to gain and glean information and, and try to, try to be a, a better father. Cause absolutely. You know, I feel sometimes I feel a little. I was telling you, I felt selfish for going to Hawaii. I just miss my kids, <laughs> you know. But um, on that business trip, but but yeah, it takes work and it's it's evolving and, and it changes. You know, I, it's different from when I first got married. The the things that we we deal with are different now than they were then. But you're always just as long as you're going towards that common goal. I feel like, but yeah, I need all the help I can get with with all of that. <laughs> Well, when we take a look at um, just the evolution of into fatherhood, obviously, when your children are born, uh, is there a switch that goes on that all of a sudden you go from being like, well, I'm the kid, I'm this, to all of a sudden you're the role model? Um, get, you know, Tommy and I have talked about this before. When we were younger, we always looked up to our grandparents, our grandmothers, our grandfathers. And then all of a sudden, as we get ready, you're a few years off from this brother, but and then all of a sudden, we're becoming the grandfathers. In your case, Brady, you'd be the father. Where that? Can you define that switch that all of a sudden, this beautiful child is looking up to me and, and I'm the influence? Crazy, yeah. You know, every time I had a, a child born, I worried about it so much before the birth and then something happens when they when they're born and, and you see them and your heart grows it reminds me of that old cartoon with the Grinch my heart I felt like my heart was tiny but every time a child was born my heart grew my capacity to love them grew and uh, that 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 flipping of the switch I still feel like a kid I was telling my sister I still feel like I'm 14 I just got I just have kids somehow but um I, I think it's happening. But also, I think that's why I love, I feel like a kid. So I love to be with kids and young young people because I still feel like I am one. So I don't know. It hasn't switched for me. I'm a kid <laughs> raising kids. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, I'll leave it at that, I guess. Yeah, and it's, I'm hitting, uh, you know, some new stages with my boys now. And it's just, um, it is it is the most incredibly rewarding time for me because now we're, speaking to each other almost as peers, right? And, and friends to a certain degree. Um, obviously every birth was unbelievable. Um, I, you know, being adopted for me, it's, it's very special because these four boys are my only blood relatives that I know. So I have this incredible bond with them. And, you know, I've just learned, I've learned that, that 
kids are way smarter than we give them credit for. And to your question, Kevin, what I realized kind of midstream from their birth to where I am now is, is how much they observe. And, and to your point, Tommy, about work, you have to pay attention to what you are doing because they are watching you. And you can lecture all you want. But that kind of goes in, especially with boys, because their brains aren't fully developed till they're 25 years old. <laughs> Clay is almost there. <laughs> but they, they watch. And so you have to pay attention to what you're doing. And that takes work, as we all know, right? When you get in a pressure field situation or something doesn't go your way, but they all watch that. So that's what I've, I've observed as I've gone through this, their lives as, as, and, and seeing them glom onto that. And now Clay and Cole will share that with me. Hey, dad, remember when you did this? And I'm like, wow, they were, yeah, I got to really pay attention. You know? oh, no. So it's, it's just amazing. And it, and it, it, it's almost freeing in a way too, because you just know that you do the right things and, and walk the talk and it influences your kids. That's been one of the biggest things for me. I'm going to ask you a question that hopefully is a little, I don't know, uncomfortable to talk about. I think as men, sometimes we don't talk about love and kind of tender feelings. Um, and I, and I know you guys both, you're very strong belief in God and a role model there. And it's a big part in your lives. So I just know that for both of you. Um, talk to us a little bit about when it's, when it's a child, right? And we've adopted, as you know, Peter, we've got two biological, two, two adopted kids. Interesting thing for me, when I think of the love I have for them, it, it's just, it's the same. In fact, I always say that the adopted ones, I probably, there's something a little more because they're, they came as underdogs into this mm -hmm. world. And so I love them just like my other kids, but they're just this little, little more thing there that I, I just hope they can make it. Uh, but when you, when you even start talking about them, the emotions I feel when I think of my kids and how much I love them, how much does love drive your behavior? How, how would you tell anyone listening to this podcast to embrace it? To, to that those tender feelings of 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 telling your kids you love them and 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 making sure they feel it too. I always used to say one of my mentors in my life was my grandpa. He lived right next door to me, and um, man, I'm glad I had that guy. Uh, I got a great father too, but my grandpa was one of these guys. When he talked to you, you heard words, but you felt what he said. And when he would look at me and tell me he loved me and that I could do anything in this world and that. He was always, I mean, I just felt it. And I thought, I want my kids to feel that. So talk about love in your, in your relationships with your kids in the context of what advice would you give a young father and, and, and any father that's out there to just love their kids and show that love? Well, it's, it's, it's very easy when they're, when they're babies, right? And they roll out of the oven <laughs> and you're, I mean, I loved that time. I, I might be a little bit of the, more the exception to the rule, but I, when Julie was done breastfeeding and, I loved getting up in the middle of the night and feed them and just hold them close. And again, I have a, a, I think a fairly unique, special bond with my boys, um, because of what I mentioned earlier, being adopted, in fact. But in our house, I, I love you is multiple times a day. And it really comes back to, you know, love as an emotion. You, you can't always just say love is an emotion. It is, but it's when you maybe don't feel like it or you don't feel it is when you have to still express it, right? So it kind of comes back to that work thing and that focus and being intentional. But at our house, and this is one of the biggest things I've learned from Julie, it's, you know, every, every hang up of the phone, even emails, you know, it's LU or whatever. And, but we mean it. And my boys, even my 23 and 25 year old, my 23 year olds a Marine, I still kiss them. I hug them. They kiss me. I mean, they, they cherish it. And, and I think that outward expression is mm. very, very important, especially for, for boys. I can only handle one woman in my life, and that's <laughs> Julie. So I can't really speak to girls and such. Um, but the boys, it's instilled in our house. And you just, you have to make it part of your practice. You have to make it part of your life. And as you do, then they embrace it. And then you see them doing it. And, it, and it's interesting because my boys, and they're, they're the leaders of their friend packs. And a lot of the reason why their friends adore them is because they'll talk to them. They'll listen to them. They'll bear their souls. But I think it started with home. So it's with, with our boys, it's, you know, open physical contact, 
to this day, and I it'll be as long as I'm around because I never had that, right? So I just selfishly, it's as much for me as I think it is for them, to be honest with you. But but we love it and just expressing it all the time. But it, it becomes a practice, and if it's not happening, that's when you kind of go, whoa, we we need to maybe check in on this. So that's how we do it at our family. But it comes back to what you said, Tommy. It's being intentional, right? And in today's world where you're separated by email and voicemail and social media, everyone gets isolated. It's really important for men to do that. It's really important because men at today's day and age are a little bit lost, right? They're not quite sure. Is that a pro, you know? But I'm a hugger too, so. I feel like you're totally right. Men to, in today's world are a little bit lost. Totally. Uh, yesterday I took my, my boy Hudson, my seven year old, over to Albertsons to go grab something. And we were walking across that last lane, you know, from the parking lot where the traffic comes across. And I looked at him and, and I hesitated for a second, but then I said, Hey, buddy, will you hold my hand? Because it's kind of to that age where he's like, maybe questioning that. I don't know, it might be kind of weird or something. But he held my hand and walked across. But I'm going to miss uh, little things like that. Well, I hope that we're always huggers. It's funny because my grandfather, who, who comes to work every day, 90 years old, I don't think he was a hugger growing up. And, and maybe it's a generational thing, you know, the depression, whatever. But, um, but my dad is a little more of a hugger and hugged, hugged me a lot. And, and I cherished that feeling that I would get from my dad and I miss it. I, you know, now that I don't see him as often, but I think that through us hugging through, through my dad teaching us to hug and us just hugging our grandfather, Marvin, it has turned him into more of a, <laughs> a loving yeah. hugger. So yeah. it's come full circle. But, um, yeah, I, I feel like I'm an extreme case too because it was hard for me to drop off my my three year old this morning at the at the uh, babysitter. I almost just kept him in the car and took him to work. I don't know what he'd be doing right now, but uh, it was hard. I double, you know, I I double guessed myself, but I love those kids so much, and and you just gotta tell them as a dad, just tell them, tell them you love them, and and, and make sure they see uh, you and your wife, you know. And you telling your wife that you love her and, and, and kissing her and, and kissing the kids. And, and Naomi, my five-year-old, she said, Dad, how many times did you kiss me last night? She told me this this morning. And I said, I kissed you, I kissed you four times because I checked on her four times because we just moved. And we're in my, my parents' house. And so it's a new experience and they're in new beds. So I checked on her a bunch. She said, I kissed you four times. And she said, but how many times did you kiss Hudson? So it's a com- it's a competition. <laughs> That's great. But, uh, just try to love them all the same and, and love them tons. It's so fun. It's great. You know, uh, going back to your point about holding the, your son's hand, how do you define when it's time for, uh, you know, your boys, your girls to, to learn life's lessons on their own? You know, so many times we want to protect children, but then all of a sudden the lessons we've all learned – are the ones that have that have hurt us. So that's got to be a huge challenge as a dad. I'm totally struggling with that right now. I'm I'm in it totally. If you don't mind, um, so my boy's on a football team, you know, and he's starting to come home with bumps and bruises, and uh, he's the, he's the smallest kid on the team. He's got a good arm, but nobody knows it, so he's playing center. <laughs> so I'm like. Right. I'm in it, man. <laughs> sure. I can't be the coach and, and give him the ball every time. So I'm, I'm figuring that out right now. And then, uh, and then my three year old running off, he's got a split tongue. He cut a little slit in his tongue and then he's got a big gash on his forehead. <laughs> and I just, I babied the older kids, but you got to let them learn, you know, and, and I guess the better that you are at that and I'm terrible at it, the quicker they, they learn what reality is and and i'll admit i'll be the first to admit that in my life growing up i was sheltered <clears throat> sheltered a little bit and going down to mexico city on my my mission was a huge wake-up call i was like holy crap this is how the world is i mean unbelievable i, I saw uh hand grenades being sold and just unbelievable pornographic stuff and and I had no idea that even existed. So with my kids, I want to I wanna just, you know, slowly let them in everything and just be holding them tight, close. But I know I can't do that. I got to let them learn. And I'm in that right now. 
and it's tough. It's it's tricky. So I want to I want to hear what Peter has to say. I need to learn. <laughs> Kevin, that is an awesome question, and and uh, I'm a I'm a thinker. You know, I love to spend time by myself. I'll go off on the mountain bike. I don't mind skiing by myself because I love to think, and I have, I develop these own little, my own little theories and models. And for that, I call it the great tension of life, and that is that if you think back just last week or a month ago and or a year ago and you think about the times when you learned the most or you grew the most as a person it's usually during an uncomfortable or a difficult time right but as humans we want to avoid those situations like the plague right and so that's why i call it the great tension of life because if you're a if you're a person striving for excellence and you want to get better that's what those difficult times will teach you so Take that down to your kids. And with four boys, you can imagine we have struggled with this. But a, a big turning point for Julie and I, uh, when Clay was in about eighth grade, so I grew up with nothing, right? No gas, no electricity, no running water. The outhouses were cold in the winter with a half inch of frost on the seat. So my goals in life were cable TV, indoor plumbing, and carpet. I mean, that motivated me, right? So fast forward, here we are, right? I live in a dream house up in the foothills. I can ride out my garage. Go I mean, life is it's great. And so we, we literally both woke up one night, Clay was in eighth grade and we realized our kids, they, they don't know how to struggle. They've never, because part of my dream was to provide this life that they're now living, but they didn't go through, they didn't have to go through any of the stuff I did. Right. But that's who made me who I am by the grace of God. I survived it. So we went through this exact same thing. And, and, and that was a pivot point for Julie and I, and our boys are in sports and all the stuff. So you can't, you have to balance all that stuff out. But we, we made a conscious intentional effort. You know, our boys were not allowed to quit. And when they did have situations come up, we'd obviously sympathy and take care of them. But it was, it was more about what can we learn from this and how are you going to grow from this? And using those, every little situation that would come up, whether it was dealing with a tough teacher, a disappointment on a sports team, an injury, whatever, those become their adversities, right? And that's what made, it's made them into the, to the young men that they are today. But that is a very, very important question and important thing for everybody to think about. Because we want to create these great lives for our kids, but in the process, they, I don't want to use the word wimp, but they just don't have that thick skin or that resiliency that you get from mm. struggling. So that's been kind of our experience. And so far it's worked. Um, and we've, they've gotten into things, whether it's Taekwondo or, you know, for long periods of time that we, we won't let them quit. You have to finish and, it, and it's worked. Uh, treating their school like a job and they have to perform at a very high level and here's how it pays off that's where being further down the road now the boys realize it and they've, they've connected the dots so that's what we've done i'm going to change the subject a little bit with you again because i i think of fatherhood is hard sometimes too and uh, we all know we, we, we're not perfect fathers. And one of the challenges, I think, for working, working dads, you provide for your family, you have stressors at work that sometimes they're high and sometimes they're low and some weeks are great and some weeks are not. And sometimes you come home at the end of the day and your emotional bucket is empty, right? And the irony of life is usually you leave in the morning when it's full and then when you come home at night to the people you love most, you know, patients are wearing a little thin. Uh, you've been at work probably, you know, barking at orders and treating others a little different than you are at home. And now your emotional energy is at zero and you walk in the door. And, and now, now the challenge is where your most important work begins. The, well, the work that lasts, right? It's not this, this, you know, temporary job thing. It's your kids. It's your posterity. It's the thing you're here to do. And yet you're, you're empty. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get to a question here in a second, but I, I always tell this story. One of my biggest failures, I, I remember the night it happened on Monday nights, we have a thing called family night where you have a little lesson on something and you try to talk about Jesus or something good and teach your kids. And my, my older two kids were super obedient, easiest kids to raise. And then we adopt these two little ones and Chloe, who's now 16 was just a hell you most of the time. She just was always defiant and always defiant. Right. And so we have a lesson on 
on reverence and just showing God respect, right? And the whole lesson's on this. And she's about seven, and we're trying to, you know, teach her something. And it's time to say the prayer at the end, and we're kneeling down at the prayer, and she's goofing off the whole time. And I remember just getting so mad because we just had this lesson on reverence, and I stood up and I chased her all the way up to her bedroom, yelling at her. And I and I and it was like this moment where I, I get all the way upstairs, and I finally catch her, and I think. What am I doing? I, you know, I, I need to be better at teachers. So I was a huge failure on my part, right? And I love telling that story because we fail, right? We, we lose our patience. We're not who we should be all the time. And so what, what's advice from the two of you to, to dads listening out there? How do you deal with the inevitable failures you have as a father? And, and, and how do you dust yourself off, forgive yourself, but learn humility? How, how, do you, how do you make that make you stronger, knowing you're going to fail again? Uh, talk, Peter and, and Ben Brady, about how to, how to build strength through failing as a father. Because I want people to know we all have our rough days, right? Absolutely. I've had, I've, <laughs> I have them all the time. And, and it's a really, again, it's something I've thought long and hard about. And for me, failures, and I, I believe this across the board in life, but, but as a father and as a husband, the failures are, are opportunities to grow, right? It's just what you do with them. And that's the first thing is you have to do something with it. If you just stuff it, which is what a lot of guys do and what we're taught to do, that's when problems occur, right? You stuff it and it, it's going to come out at some point. And the more you stuff it, the, the bigger it gets. And so, and I've learned a lot of this from my wife, Julie, but back to how smart kids are and how much they observe. When you fail, when you get upset, it doesn't, and you come back around, it's, it's extremely powerful to ask for forgiveness from your kids. It is, it is one of the most powerful things you can do because, number one, you're asking for forgiveness for yourself, but they, they learn the practice, right? And it's just, it, there's so many things that come out of it. Humility, you know, honesty, openness, and that's one of the biggest things that Julie has taught me. My wife, she is just unbelievable at it. And it's just, it's a critical thing to learn and, and those opportunities. Now, it doesn't mean that you condone the behavior of your daughter going crazy while you're trying to have prayer time, right? But you know what, Tommy? She knows that, right? You don't need to, she doesn't need to have her face rubbed on the carpet. But that simple act is, is incredibly powerful. That's what I've learned with my boys. And we have these discussions. And even when they're, so I've got a 17 year old now and he's flapping his wings, you know, and he likes to flap them in our face. And, but we, we have these discussions and I'll lose my temper. He's being disrespectful to his mother or he's not sharing, you know, what's going on in his life or, you know, letting us know where he's at. And, and, and it's, to, it's a good thing just to take a deep breath, you know, the spur of the moment, things are hard, but to talk through it. So then they, they understand how you're feeling too. This comes back to that feeling thing. They understand it, but the, the power of asking for forgiveness is it's immeasurable. And that's not just with your kids in life in general, but with your kids in particular, it's, it's unbelievable. It's a life skill that you're then having the opportunity to teach them live. So that's my fantastic. I, I need to work on that and being able to ask them for forgiveness. Cause I mess up every day. We all do. I know. And what, Tommy, when you're explaining it, it's, it's at the end of a, a long day when you're, just physically and emotional, mentally exhausted. How do you do it? I know it's it. And I want to know, my dad would tell me that you have endless energy and you don't <laughs> like to barely sleep at night and, and I have all this energy and how do you do it? I, yeah. I want to ask you. <laughs> but, but it's actually one of my, one of the things that I feel most guilty about actually is because, because even though I do, it's, it, it, it seems like you always save your best for the people who matter the least. Yeah. It just is the way it is. And so, you know, I, it's forgiveness. It's, Hey, I'm sorry. And it's, it's consciously saying, I'm walking in this house and it, it's time to, it's time to, this is the time to shine now. And, uh, you know, I, you know, you get through life, right? You're on the other end, Brady, but uh, Peter's been a good mentor to me. I don't know how many times we've talked Peter where, where uh, a couple of times this guy, we've had long discussions at lunch where you said, Hey, you got to just balance. You got to, you, you've got to balance this thing because if you don't, um, you don't get these days back. And so, yeah, you got to forgive yourself and ask for forgiveness, but also you have got to check yourself and make sure you're balancing yourself with God and your family 
and work. And, and you, you better keep it in that order too. Um, I think we all, uh, we all need more self evaluations of our balance with God, family, and work. And if we do that, um, probably make some adjustments so you're not coming home so empty. Yeah. yeah. And I could throw out some ideas too, just that these are just what I've learned. So, uh, one of my top five books is Mars and Venus Together Forever. It's not Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. It's the combo book, which a lot of people haven't read. And it is one of the funniest books you read. This guy understands couples. And when I read a book or go to a conference or a seminar, if I can come away with between one and three nuggets, I consider it a win, right? So one of the things that I took out of that book, uh, the author calls it cave time. So when you come home from work and you're wiped out, and the kids are, especially for you, Brady, because they're beeline for dad, and you're just like, oh. I do love that moment. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> but when you pretend it's one of those moments when you're wiped out. And so what he recommends is you just take a little time and you go up, and whether it's changing your clothes, and you just have a little bit of cave time, <laughs> literally 15 minutes. It doesn't take much. Clear your head, think about being intentional, and then, and it's funny how your wife will appreciate it and your kids, and they, they get into this. They get into this routine. I, I had that. And then the other thing as far as, you know, what I call energy management throughout the day is fortunately where my kids went to school, I did things like playground duty every other Tuesday. It was for an hour. And all I would do is show up and just watch the kids. And I get to see who my kids' friends are. And my kids would come over and say hi, but they just knew that dad was there amongst all these moms. And they thought that was pretty cool. And so you just find these little spots. And, and by the way, kids... They just want you to be around as the dad. They just want you to know that you're around and you're watching. That's what I've learned with my boys. They've told me that. So all these little interspersions where you have opportunities and, and you have to be intentional and disciplined. You have to schedule some things sometimes. But that's been a huge part of that, what I call energy management throughout the day. So Just to add to that, you know, a few things. I had a great example from my dad on, on that moment, you know, getting home from work. But, but overall, just balancing everything. But I'm real thankful for, for my wife, Janae. I've heard her before I've come in that door where she hears the garage and knows that I'm coming home and she preps the kids and she'll say, dad's coming, you guys, and they turn off the iPads or whatever. And then it's like, we've turned it into like a celebration when I come in the door and we're cheering. And sometimes we raise the roof, you know, and I'm pointing at them and it, it's become this giant celebration thanks to my wife. And that really changes my mood, yeah. you know, but, but those hard days, yeah, I've done the cave time in my driveway for a minute, you know, finishing the radio talk show or the chapter in my book or whatever, I'll finish it, then pull in the driveway and then it's celebration time. So that's helped a ton, Great. I think. You know, when we look at, um, as men, as people, we're, we're taught to achieve and, you know, there's role models of, you know, like Bill Belichick or Nick Saban, where it's all about the job. But when you're a dad, it's the complete opposite. So how do you balance that? It's just kind of playing off what Tommy talked about a moment ago. Just going from, it's not about me, it's about we, and all of a sudden you're giving everything you have uh, to make uh, to make your son, your daughter better. That's it's confusing today. I feel like because a lot of the role models, they are they're they're a hundred percent whatever they do. A lot of these successful guys. That we look at, you know, um, Gary Vaynerchuk or or the uh, Tesla, Elon Musk, or whatever. It seems like a hundred percent. They're a hundred percent business. But y'all, I, that would not be happy for me. I already know I, I need more. I need my kids and my wife, or else none of this would even matter. So I also feel like it's 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 refreshing to be reminded. I went and saw my mom over in the Philippines, and it's refreshing to be reminded that on the same side with women, that the role model isn't this, you know, what we see maybe in the public eye, this flashy, it's, it's the hardworking mothers that are, that are raising kids. And, and of course, us as fathers that, you know, we come together and we do it together in, in the family unit. And that's just so different from what you see, but it's all about, I think the family unit. And, and that's why I love Boise because uh, we're, we're a family community, but, um, but yeah, hard to do because the role models we see and the, the role models I saw growing up, they don't, they don't show you that. 
So I'm just impressed you pronounced Gary's last name correctly. Yeah, that was a, that was like my first time. Kind of <laughs> Clutch. <laughs> yeah, that, that's another uh, great question, and I actually got some good prep for that. Unintentional. My my niece who just moved here about a year ago from uh, San Diego. Another disruption for my wife's Southern California family. Loves it here, and she sent me this email out of the blue. She said, "Uncle Pete, I want to meet with you." I said, "Okay." You know, I'm always available. She was right over the hill from us. And she said, but I know you're like Clay. Clay's my oldest. She, she goes, I know you like to think about things. So she listed out these five questions for me to think about before we met. And they were all about success. You know, I, I consider you very successful. And, you know, how do you define success and all that? So it really gave me a weekend to really think it through. And um, for me, it, it it's... It is all about my marriage and my family. That is what drives my relationship with God, my wife, and my kids. That's what drives everything. And I've developed ways to have my, uh, I don't know, I would say male outlet, if you will. You know, it, and by that, I mean, I'm a very competitive person, extremely competitive, but a lot of it's internal. And I want to be the absolute best husband ever. I mean, and I'm driven to be the, and that's what drives me to do a lot of this stuff. And Julie knows that. And of course she loves it, but I want to be the best husband. And consequently, I want to be the best dad. So I can't control everything, but that is what I put most of my energy towards. Um, I still have to work. I still have to provide. But for me, that's what defines success. So I was speaking to my niece about this. And I said, her name's Megan. I said, Megan, if I, if tomorrow's my last day, or if next week's my last week and I'm gone, I can tell you right now, I would feel very, very good about it, my time on the planet. And I would consider my life a success. But it's not because of the last deal I did or the car I'm driving or the house we live in. Those are all nice things. But these relationships and seeing where Julie is, um, seeing where the boys are, that is what gives me my definition of success. And I mean that through and through, but it, you can have fun with it too, right? It's, it's, it is fun to be competitive. I, I love that part of it. And, and the boys know it, you know, and it's not an over the top way, but we talk about it. You know, I want to, how can I be better as a dad? I have this discussion with them. You know, what else can we do? And they're like, well, I don't know. They kind of think it's crazy, but that's what I'm always trying to do to improve those relationships. And that's how I define my success. Could I add something to that? It, something that I've that been real interesting, just really quick, that I that I learned or have observed over the last, I guess, just a decade. So it's small, small sample size. But I went to dealer school in D.C., car dealer school, and it's kids from all over the country. We had somebody from Boston, from Florida, from from all parts, New Jersey, and I keep in touch with with my generation. There's about forty five of us. We all have a group on on Facebook, and it's fascinating to see all these different people from across the United States, from all different parts, and which ones have chosen to just do work exclusively and, and which ones have somewhat of a balance with, with family, you know, that takes up some of their time, maybe religion and just other things, activities. out, And the ones that, that are just business, that I think they're probably making a lot of money, but it just doesn't seem happy to me. And, and I think deep down they know it, but the ones who are like trying to be good dads and there's some women, the ones that are trying to be good moms, just seem so much happier, you know, especially when I talk to them and when we chat, it seems like their lives are more fulfilled or there's something different. I'm 10 years into my study, so we'll see. In study, time. that's what you call it. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, I think we both have an idea of what inspires both of you, but if you'd like to share that with us now. Yeah, I mean, I've covered most of it, I think. And, and so taking it the next step further in, in giving back and because of what I have experienced in my journey so far, I, I love to help other people in their journeys. That really, that fulfills my days. And, and that's what I was mentioning earlier. Commercial real estate, it's a great career. It's fun to do deals. You get adrenaline rushes, you know, solving problems, all those things. But it is truly my platform for being able to do that. And I had no idea what this was going to be, right? But but even the opportunity to share this information, my experiences, if it helps one or two people out there, that 
that inspires me because I think that's really what life's about. It's it's kind of the next level after our most intimate relationships with our wife and our kids. And that's really what we're here for is to help other people. I mean, it's the yeah. second commandment, right? And so that is that's what gets me excited. I consider it a good day if I've I feel, if I've helped one person. Um, that resume I sent you, Tommy, uh, Max, yeah. moving back here is a kid that grew up in Boise. He's finishing his military career, highly decorated, Purple Heart, Green Beret, and 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 I know I can call on Tommy as busy as he is, and he'll take the time to speak with this kid. And you just, I've just seen it. You just never know how it impacts him. You might see it a week later, two months later, but. That's what it's really all about is connecting with people on a personal level. And that's, that's what inspires me. And if I can use my life and my core relationships to do that, it's far more gratifying than my next real estate deal. That's good. Yeah. I, I guess uh, I'm inspired by, I'm inspired by everybody in this room. I'm inspired today, you know, just reflecting on these things. I feel like whenever I had the assignment or the paper in college that, that I'm writing for somebody else or whatever, it's always helping me more. So, but I'm just inspired. I'm inspired by a, a father um, who's a million miles away in the Philippines. I'm inspired by a grandfather that's 90. That's now a bigger part of my life. I'm inspired by my children um, and and by my wife who who uh, you know is away from her family. She's out here taking a chance on with me in, the, in Boise. I'm inspired by just the, the small and simple things and. Uh, it's it's rooted for me. It's rooted in in serving other people, like you said, and and our Savior, and and hopefully, you know, this joint that you know to share some of the, the what you know what I feel inspires me, which is which is my Savior. So I don't want to get too religious on everybody, but but for me, it's it is it's family and, and religion, and uh, and it's people. I love people just like you, and. Um, so I'm, my dad put me in charge of 512 people and I don't even know all of them, you know, but, uh, but I love all those people I get to work with and see every day. And, and you just, it's funny, you just, the more people you meet and in my business, I, I feel like they're an extension of my family and, and you care for them and you love them. And, and, uh, I, I don't know, I feel like we can conquer the world after just talking about this stuff, but, <laughs> but, uh, just a lot of gratitude and, and love in my heart. So. Thank you. Thanks for letting me be a part of this. Well, I want to thank both of you. I, you know, we've done a lot of these. Um, most of the time we're talking about business. <laughs> we've talked about some good stuff, community service. We've had some great people in here, but um, as I've been sitting here listening today, I, I just think about my four kids and I think about, you know, what they each mean to me. And, and I hope that, uh, I hope that anyone listening today can just, can just, just put the effort in. Be intentional. Don't give up. Have bad days. Learn from them. Be humble. Um, ask for forgiveness and move on. Show love. I think there's been so many good things said today that uh, we can take a big dose of today and, and sprinkle it around. Uh, this is a good thing. So can't thank you enough. I love and appreciate you both. I appreciate your examples. I really sincerely do and for what it's meant to me. Uh, Peter, uh, those lunches during during a campaign when I was down and I'd always leave thinking, man, I love that guy. And and Brady, I love you too. And, and your dad, uh, that guy, um, that's one of my best friends. And I, if, if I could just be a little bit like him every day, I'd be doing okay. So thanks for being here with us today. And we want to wish everybody um, a healthy dose of inspiration and to strive for excellence. You've been listening to the Inspire Excellence Podcast. We invite you to find something that inspires you this week. Join us again for our next episode.